People are lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy. This generation, which includes baby boomers, Generation X, the millennials and centennials, tell a person next to you is just not the young people. We have OGs up in here acting crazy. <laughs> Go and tell somebody next to you, tell somebody on the other side, say it's just not the young people acting up. We have OGs up in here acting crazy. Have laws their mind. This generation even tells the Almighty that you got to accept me for who I am because I am your creation. And you supposed to love everybody no matter what because you, God, you are love and you supposed to love unconditionally. So no matter my lifestyle, you got to love me. Tell somebody they lost their mind. With my hands lifted up and my mouth filled with praise. With the heart of thanksgiving, oh, I will bless you, oh Lord, my Elohim. I will bless you not only with the fruits of my lips, but I will bless you with my life through dedication and faithfulness. Happy Sabbath, everyone. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm telling you, all week long, I was thinking about this moment. I couldn't wait to get into the house of the Lord where the saints assemble just to say, Father, I thank you for all the things that you've done. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. With our hands lifted up and our mouth is filled with praise. Hallelujah! 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 My hallelujahs are not, it's not my highest praise, oh Father, but my hallelujahs acknowledges and it bears witness of the I am this of your greatness and the expression of my gratitude. They thank you for all of the things that you've done. Uh, thank you for bringing me through dangers and unseen dangers. Yes, you kept me from it all. Thank you for how you kept my family. Thank you for how you kept a touch of grace members. I haven't received a phone call this week of any type of urgency. Father, you kept us. You provided us for us. Our circle hasn't been broken this week, Father. And we say thank you. We give you praise. You are the source of our strength. You are the strength of our lives. That's why on this Sabbath afternoon we lift our hands in total praise to give you what you so richly deserve. You deserve our praise. You are worthy of it. 
Father, as we about to start our worship service, Oh, Father, we can't do this without you. We, we need your presence here. We need reviving. We need your touch. Some people need a healing. And then there are others who need a deliverance. So, Father, we yield our vessels to you. We yield our vessels that you may have your own way. We recognize and realize, Father, that we need you on this day. We need you in our life every day, every minute, every hour. We need you, oh, Father. We need you and we can't make this journey without you. We need your spirit. We need your power to lead and guide us and to teach us. Father, we'll forever give your name to praise. To be a light shining that people may see our good work and glorify our Father which is in heaven. The God of the universe. The God of creation. The God who has made everything. So, Father, tabernacle with us here in this place and bless your people. In Yahshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, and amen. Out of the didactic Psalms, we know the book of Psalms. It gives you, in a portion of the Psalms, it gives you instructions. And one of my favorite is Psalms 100. Oftentimes I see people coming to the sanctuary and to the house of worship and they come with things on their mind. Sometimes I notice the faces and some people look like they just got out of the car uh, arguing. <laughs> the look of anger coming into the house of the Lord. And some folks, when they come, they look like they, they tired. They don't have any energy. And then there are others who seem to be preoccupied with other things. I'm assuming about the hustles and bustles of life, wondering how they're going to, uh, to, to, to pay their rent, pay their mortgage, or whether their lights are going to be turned out. People come to the house of worship with a lot of things on their minds. But here the writer said in Psalms 100, Say, make a joyful noise unto Yahweh, all ye land. Serve Yahweh with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Now, I'm going to pause right here because what I want you to do is take a self-evaluation of yourself and just, just, this is take a moment to think. When you enter into his presence, whether it's at home, on a job, in your car, how do you come before his presence? What type of attitude are you displaying at, at, at that particular time? And I need you to be honest because we need, when we come into the house of worship, we need to come with our minds Focus on praise and adoration, giving him the thing and leaving all of the other stuff outside of the doors. Because whatever you're going through, guess what? Guess what? When you praise, when you come before his presence, I, I, I promise you it won't even be on your mind because his presence is like that. His presence, there is joy in his presence. There is peace in 
his presence. So I want you to just, just evaluate how you come into the house of the Lord and follow these directions here of the Psalms of David. Psalms of David, he says, serve them with gladness. I know some, even the young people, I want to talk to some of the young people. You come to church reluctantly. Sometimes, you know, you're at the place now where, you know, you really don't feel like coming to church sometimes. So mom and dad say, look as long as you are in my home, in this house, when we go to worship, you are going along as well. And most of the time when, when that is enforced upon you, when you come through these doors, you're not happy. You're not smiling because you really don't want to be there. But let me give you something to think about and marinate on it a little bit. You know what? There were some kids this week that, that got or beat up in school. There were some kids that lost their life in automobile accidents. There were some kids that lost their mind because they took an overdose of drugs. There were some kids that was out there minding your business, their business and now they're somewhere laying up in a hospital fighting for their life. And what am I saying? I'm saying you ought to, you ought to be glad that you can get to the house of the Lord because you owe him a praise. Why? Because it could have been you that got killed. It's going to have been you that lost your mind. It could have been you that was laying up in a hospital. But his grace and his mercy and the prayers of your mom and your dad and your church community cover you because every week we pray the prayer Lord keep our young people safe in this crazy world but yet you gotta have an attitude when mom and dad say get up and go to the, to the house of worship where you ought to be grateful verse number three said know ye that Yahweh he is Elohim it is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastors. Don't you know, you know, we, we had a place where it's all about me, 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 what I want to do, what your will is. But this thing is not about not a, about you. It was your way who made you. The reason you're here is because your way made you and created you for a purpose. And what you need to be doing is praying to him and say, Father, I know you brought me here for a, re for a reason. It's not by haphazard that I'm here. There's a reason that you created me. Father, I don't know what it is right now, but help me to see what defines me so I can embrace it. Young people, you got to mature. It's time. Our young teenagers, you got to focus on the future. You have to focus on your future and you need to know what it is that God has for you. And the only way you're going to know that is that you have to have a relationship with him. And the only way you're going to have a relationship with him is through prayer, through fasting, by coming to worship. But when you come, don't come, you know, being sad. You know, don't, no, no, don't do that. Because he, like even myself, because I tell, I used to tell, look, if you're going to be sad, look, if you're going to be sad, you know, we're going to do something about that. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Y'all hear me, my brothers and my sisters. When you come into his presence, when you come through these doors, you ought to enter it with thanksgiving. That's why that you leave everything that's outside the door. I don't care even if you're going through a lot of stuff. You still ought to be thankful. Because it could be worse. We often hear People say many times that, you know, there's other people that have it worse than I do. You owe him a praise right there. 
Say, be thankful unto him and bless his name. Well, you can't bless his name when you're sad. You can't bless his name when you act like you don't want to be here. Church number five said, for Yahweh, he's been good. And his mercy is everlasting. And his truth endure to all generations. And you ought, to really, you ought to be really glad about that. Because his truth, his truth is the thing that's going to help you to stand. His truth is going to be the thing that get you from earth to glory. His truth. So when you come into his presence... I, I tell this congregation all of the time, I don't believe in pumping and prying, prying, playing circus, going around the merry go around, get up, sit down, get up, sit down. I don't do that. You ought to come into his presence with an attitude of gratitude. And if I see you sitting down, guess what? I'm going to let you sit down. And I'm going to praise him even the more because I want, I want everything that Yahweh has for me. If you don't want your blessing, if you don't want to recognize and acknowledge who he is, but guess what? I'll do it for you and I'll receive double portion. Oh, I will bless the Lord, oh, my soul. So I encourage you, my brothers and my sisters, to follow this didactic instruction here out of the book of Psalms. Whenever you come into his presence, do so with gladness. Serve him with gladness. Even when you're going through, don't cry the blues. Amen, y'all. I taught you the Beatitudes in Matthew. You know, you ought to be glad when people talk about you and ridicule you because the Bible says when that happens, you are blessed. When you're going through tough times because you find yourself at school or you find yourself in the workplace and you're living a life of right, righteousness and everything that around you, it seems like they, that they, they just don't have no respect or anything because they just do what they do, these ungodly people. And a lot of times you are the subject of their lunchtime conversation, you know. And But you ought to be glad. Don't be sad because people are not accepting you. But I tell you what, when they get in trouble, the first person they're going to come to is that one who they know that it has a relationship with the Lord. They come to you and say, my brother, my sister, I'm going through some tough things right now. Will you pray to your God for me? That's why we ought to always let our light so shine. We praise Yahweh for the reading of this word. For his word are true. Words are power. And in these words, he have all of the answers for you. And before one word, one jot of his word fail, heaven and earth will pass away. So you in good hands, amen, with the word of Yahweh. Amen. Amen. We'll be reading Exodus chapter 20, verses number 7. Down to verse 17. These are the Decalogues that was written by the fingers of Yahweh and given to Moses for the people of Israel. Commandments that stand to this day. Matter of fact, I'm just going to start from verse 1. Normally we would start from verse number, uh, number 8. If I remember the Sabbath today, but today I want to read it in its entirety because we're living in a time and a dispensation where people are serving other gods. You must know there's only one true living God. And, and Yahweh says that 
You, you know, don't serve other gods. You won't have no other, don't put no other gods before me in my presence. So here we are, first number one, coming out of the book of Exodus, chapter 20. And Elohim spake all these words, saying, I am Yahweh, thou Elohim, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other Elohim before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I, Yahweh, thou Elohim, am a jealous El. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, that hates me, I'm sorry, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of Yahweh thy Elohim. In vain, for Yahweh will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh thy Elohim. In it thou shalt, thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy maid servant, nor thy maid, ser maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days Yahweh, he made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, Yahweh bless the Sabbath day and hallow it. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which Yahweh thy Elohim giveth thee. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against Thou neighbors, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, nor his maid servant, nor his man servant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor. And in the summary that was added by the son of Yeshua, the God sure say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. These are the words and the commandments of our Savior, our God, the Creator. Amen. so good to be here in the house of the Lord one more time. On today, it's my turn to, to lead out in praise and adoration. And I'm excited about it. <laughs> Amen. As we know, a man is on maternity leave. She's about to give birth to another healthy boy, and so I put her on maternity leave, ministry of maternity leave. I know you all miss Amanda, amen. I know y'all miss Amanda because she's full of power, full of word, and full of Yahweh's spirit.
and know he's grateful.
when nothing else could help it was love that lived them. Love reached out and picked me up out of the memory clay. You may be lost. Right now in a lot of pain. Not physical pain, but emotional pain. Wondering what you're going to do. Where you're going to go. How you're going to survive. How you're going to pay your mortgage, your rent. How you gonna survive with these kids? Well, one thing I like to tell you: don't give up. No, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. That spirit of suicide, I come up against you. You're not going to take your life today. You're not going to take your life today. Reach down inside. Feel. He's right there. He's right there waiting to aid you. It's an expression of gratitude, being thankful for all that he's done and all that he has been. For we've come to know him and his many characters, the many hats that he wears. Whatever I needed him to be, in my life, he was just that. He was uh, my lawyer in the courtroom, and he never lost the case. He was my physician when I wasn't feeling well. He gave me the prescriptions that I needed to, to make me whole again. When I was low in monies and didn't have monies to put food on my table, he was a provider. He was a Jehovah Jireh, and he provided for all that I need. That's why I give him a hallelujah praise because there's so many things that he done for me, I just consolidated into that expression of praise of hallelujah, bearing witness to his I amness. My brothers and sisters, whatever you're dealing with, he'll be that just for you, whatever you need him to be. But there's a contingency factor in there. You have to be connected to him for he will give you the desires of your heart and when you go when you find yourself in trouble he will bless you he will sustain you while you going through your storm of life he will never leave you neither will he forsake you he'll be right there 
by your side. And that's why I love him today. That's why I serve him faithfully because he's never abandoned me in a time of need. Even when things were going really well for me, he was there to remind me. Sutton, it could be the other way. That's why I'm always grateful. Whatever state I'm in, I'm grateful because I know by him being my, by my side, he will lead and he will guide me to the area where I need to be, where I can please him. That's one thing I love. I love pleasing him because see, what happened is when he delights in me, when he delights in you, he's sitting up on the throne and he's smiling and he's feeling real good and he said, you know what? That that Sutton had been so faithful. He'd been through some songs, so I'm going to give him some of my unmerited favor. Things that, things that he didn't work for, things that he really don't deserve, but the thing it is that I delight in him. I'm going to bless him real good, so every now and then he'll open up a window and pour me out blessings that I won't even have room to, to, to store. That's the God I serve. And that's why I say hallelujah because it bears my witness of the almighty sovereign God. The God of the universe. Huh. Don't I get me started uh, this afternoon. Oh, I feel his presence in this building. Because I feel his, the power of his anointing on my life right now. I feel his power. And whenever I feel his presence, whenever I feel his presence, his presence did not only come from me, but it came from you. I got good news. Get ready for your breakthrough because the power of the Holy Ghost is getting ready to set you free. So open your ears and open up your mind and open up your heart to receive this blessed word of God. God that's going to liberate you to get you out of the clutch of the devil's hand and out of the bondage, the things that's been holding you. He comes to set you free on this Sabbath day. That's good news. On today we're going to conclude the six part series on soteriology which is defined as the doctrine of salvation. Oh, this word today is going to really liberate you. But before I get started into my lesson for today, I'm going to give a brief synopsis on our five pre previous segments just to refresh the mind of uh pertinent information that is relevant to fully intellectualize this final chapter on today. Now, our opening commentary expressed the purpose and objectives for this series, which is to give insight on the fundamental foundation and overview on the doctrine of salvation. My brothers, and my sisters, we are currently uh, living in an era where the course and pathway to salvation has been altered. Yes, it has. It has been modified, redefined, and reinterpreted uh, by ancient Rome creation of the religious institution known today to us as Christianity, and Rome also established legislation that dictated how and who we worship while withholding a hidden truth up to this day. In our modern era of religious pluralism, the doctrine of salvation is altered by those who, whose mindset had customized their preference of worship 
and lifestyle. In other words, now, Father, you know, God is not about you. It's all about me, what I want, what I desire, how I want to live. That is how people, is the mindset of our generation of today, how they worship, how they believe salvation is. And because of the diverse presence of many denominations and religious practices here in America, I encourage you to take the time to invest in your spirituality and research the validity of your faith to be sure it's connected to the source that offers true salvation. Statistics says 80% of the people that practice religion here in America is a product of family traditions. If you grew up in a household that was Baptist, more than likely you will grow up in the Baptist faith throughout your life. Whether it's Catholicism or Judaism and Islam, Catholic, or mainline Protestant, whatever, whatever you grew up in, that is the thing that you're going to embrace practically your whole life. So it's important that you investigate to make sure you are in line. In our second segment, we define what salvation is. It's the act of saving or protecting from harm, risk, loss, and destruction. Why is it that we need salvation? It's because of Adam's disobedience when he ate the fruit from the forbidden tree, sin into the world, and Yahweh had warned Adam, if you eat from that tree, that you shall surely die. That is why we need salvation. Sin, Yahweh is going to destroy when he comes back. At the end of time, he said, sin, I'm going to destroy. The wages of sin is death. And how he going to destroy it? He's going to destroy it with, with, with hell, lake, fire, and brimstone. So this is what he's saving us from, a life of sin, so we can escape the clutches of the lake of fire. Those words you'll find in Genesis chapter number 2, verse 17. This is the reason why salvation was needed. There in segment 3, we shared how the core of salvation came to existence. For Yahweh so loved the world that he gave. And what did, what did he do? He gave reparation through redemption by way of his son for something that he didn't even do. Did you hear what I said? I said Yahweh gave, rep gave reparation through redemption by way of his son for something Yahweh didn't even do. He told him not to eat that fruit. He didn't make him eat the fruit. Adam decided that he was going to eat the fruit. But yet, the love of Yahweh, he gave reparation so man, he can save men, the mankind, this world from sin. Not only did Yahweh give of himself, he gave his son. His son gave his life. And his son ain't had nothing to do with the disobeying uh, Yahweh's word either. The son didn't sin. His son didn't sin. God didn't sin. But yet they so loved. Yahweh so loved the world. And Yahshua so loved his father to the fact that he was going to be obedient even until the death on the cross. What man of love is that? So the core of salvation, Yahweh pulled out of himself his son. He pulled out of his son who was going to, his son who was going to redeem 
us from the curse of the law. He was going to go to redeem and save us from sin. That's what he was going to do. That's what his son came to do, that he was going to come and be with us. And then out of Yahweh, he poured his spirit, the Ruach of God, his spirit that it may dwell in us because the time was going to come when Yahshua's work was done here on the earth and he was going to leave his disciples. He said, I'm going, not going to leave you comfortless. I'm not going to leave you alone in this mean old dark ugly world. I'm going to send my comforter and it shall lead you. It shall guide you. It shall, it shall be with you. Teach you all truth and most importantly when that trumpet sound that it is that power it is that spirit it's that's going to raise you up from the dead and those who remain it's that same power that's going to lift you up and 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 catapult you into the air to meet our loving savior And because of that, salvation was made available to those who are willing to bear the due process. The core of salvation consists of Yahweh the Father, Yeshua the Son, the Ruach, the indwelling spirit. Yahweh's heart was moved with compassion. He released his mercy by extending his grace. That's good news. Tell somebody that's good news. And out of that experience, we understand that, that Yahshua was signed to redeem mankind from the curse of the law, believing, in that, believing now that the curse is no longer, that it has been removed and replaced by grace. This is the way people think right now. But we learn that, that it wasn't the law that was cursed. No, God's law was never curse. We found out that the curse of the law was the penalty and the punishment of the law. That was the curse of the law. That is what uh, Yeshua's sacrifice has done away with was the penalty. In other words, when we sin, we should have died. We should have been cut off. But the grace and the mercy of God through his son, Yeshua Stop the penalty, stop the punishment, and gave us a reprieve till we could find a way. You will find that in Galatians 3.13 and Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22-23. Let's move on because I want to get to my lesson. In segment four, the path of salvation, we covered the lineage and nativity of the shore through reading assignments. We also covered some of Yahshua's ministry, journey, and life lesson messages that he taught his disciples on kingdom principles, behavior, commitment to relationship, obedience, and dedication to the faith. And you will find that information in Matthew's chapter 5 in that famous sermon on the mount entitled the Beatitudes. John chapter 14 where Yeshua declares by authority given to him by his father that he is the way, the truth, and the light. And no man comes to the father except by him. Amen. And I'm telling you, I'm getting all excited. I am getting excited this morning, this afternoon. In chapter 15 of the same book of John, Yahshua lets his disciples know that they must remain in fellowship with him to receive salvation, that without him they could not, they would not succeed. And last week's segment, number five, we talked about the altered 
path. We share in contrast the original design of doctrine of salvation when it was in the earliest days of the dawn of the created order of Yahshua, contrasting it to our postmodern era verse. In other words, the era that we're living in. And we identified and found out that there were various changes made, changes that took religion, worship, Churches, people, let me say that again, changes that took religion, worship, churches, people out of the original intended pathway of salvation to an altered pathway. Now on today, I want to start today's lesson with a quote from uh, Ravi Zacharias, who is a distinguished international renowned Christian apologetic. He is an Indian native who now resides in the state of Georgia in the city of Atlanta. And he said, and I quote, it's the gathering storms of religious pluralism that has disoriented Western Culture. Let me say that again from Brother Rafi Zacharias. He said that it's the gathering storms of religious pluralism that has disoriented Western culture. And he asks this question How do you reach a generation that listens with its eyes and thinks? with its filling. And I said to myself, I said, wow, what a profound statement. Let me read that to you again. The question was, how do you reach a generation that listen with its eyes and think with its filling? And Ravi answered and said, you reach them by being an apologetic, one whose answers question. Let me say that again. By being ap apologetic. What is an apologetic? P apologetic is one who answers questions. I grew up in the church, and whenever I had a question, I never got a direct answer. The only answer I got was something like, well, because the Bible says so. But they never gave me any information, whether it was uh, more references uh, out the Bible or whether historical references. They just say it's because God said. But I needed more information. I needed to know why do we go to church on Saturday night? Don't just tell me that the Bible said I need some proof. I need something other than, than the book. You know, I just can't pattern my life out of a book, something that was published by man. I'm not saying that this is not the word of God, but I know that there is some information that must have been left out, that some information that has been left out that will fill in the gap. So I need information. And so this is what an apologetic does. They go be above and beyond what we see in the book. And I respect the academic prowess, how they just seek knowledge and they just investigate. And they just don't Google it. Many, many of them get on planes and go to various countries to understand their cultures, to see how things work. Why is it that they, they, they do that? And when they do that, it gives them clarity of what they have seen in the scripture. Now they understand the lifestyle. They understand the culture. So thank you, Brother Rafi, for uh, uh, allowing me to actually for getting this information. That was a powerful question 
Amen. It's because of your hard work and your dedication that others are blessed. We have a lot of scholars and, and people that are just interested in knowing the truth. And another thing that uh, Brother Ravi has said that, that I often uh, 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 use, amen, and I do give him credit. I don't act like I'm so smart. But Brother Ravi said, he said, you know, to find the truth, when you're searching for the truth, to find the truth, he said, that is easy. That's the, that's the easy part. But the hard part is that when you find the truth, it's embracing the truth. Because after practicing something one way for so long, it's hard to grasp that you've been doing it a wrong, wrong, that there's a better way, that there's another way. After practicing something for 40 and 50 years, you're set in your way. It's hard to embrace a truth when you hear it. So, so it is my desire that every question concerning the doctrine of salvation is answered without a doubt. It is my desire that all of you that sit here under my teaching that's in this ministry, that you understand thoroughly about salvation because when you know the science of salvation and there is no doubt in your heart and your mind it helps you to walk the path without any disruption what I mean disruption is that people can come with another gospel trying to teach you another way but because you understand the true science of salvation how it was originated how it came into birth amen once you understand that then nothing is going to turn you away off that road that straight and narrow so this is why we took the time to do this series on soteriology the doctrine of salvation. Let us pray. Father, use your servant for your glory. I pray that in my communication, Father, that I will articulate these words in a way that people will understand and that it will be simple, that they will not be confused. It will be easy to digest. And Father, I pray for the listener that they may open up their ears, open up their hearts and minds just to, just to be, uh, you know, uh, perceptive to, to what is, you know, to what is being said, to at least to, to, to think about it, to hear it, to receive it, and hear it, and then on their own, if they need to research it, they should research it. But Father, open their ears and their minds and understanding that they may receive this gospel. The Bible declares in the prophetic writings from the Apostle Paul in his epistles, which are his personal letters, uh, pastoral instructions to his son and the faith. This son, in, in particular, uh, coming from this pericope, uh, is his son Timothy. And he wrote these epistles while he was uh, imprisoned in Rome awaiting execution. This frightening horror, stunning, prophetic epistle warns of the epidemic that will plague the generations in the last days. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter number 3 and navigate down to verse number 2. I'll be reading from the New International Version. I'll pause a minute while those are pulling out their electronic devices and, and some of you have your Bibles and I see you turning. And, and from what I see, my brother, you're in, the, you're in the Old Testament. You need to go into the New Testament, okay? Go past the middle of the book, but close to the end of the back of the Bible. You'll find Timothy. 
Amen. It's okay. When we were younger, we used to play uh, Bible games and speed reading, and and, and whoever uh, found the, uh, the, the, the the passage of scripture faster, you got awarded. Back in those days, it was like a quarter, but they added up because they would do at least ten scriptures, and and uh, and I was good at that, man. I used to walk away every Sabbath with about two dollars and two dollars and fifty cents. Amen. And then, you know, our mothers, they made us study. See, back in the old days, we, we knew when I was three years old, uh, not only did I know the Decalogue and the 100 Psalms and, and the 23rd Psalms, I've learned uh, the book of the Bible, 66 books of the Bibles. Uh, amen. And, uh, and, and, and yes, we know we used to have to quote the scriptures from, from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Yes, and I won that too. Matter of fact, a lot of the kids in our ministry, when I was growing up, we had I mean, our ministry was really great uh, in doing that. And we need to go back to some of those old traditions. You know, we always doing new things, but some of those old traditions are still relevant, amen, and it will bless uh, our children. It will bless us, amen. Everybody have it. And this epistle that was written by Paul given to Timothy, and it said, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, and unholy. Now, this sounds like the era that we're currently living in. Are we not living these words out? People are lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy. This generation, which includes baby boomers, Generation X, the millennials and centennials, Tell a person next to you is just not the young people. We have OGs up in here acting crazy. <laughs> Go and tell somebody next to you, tell somebody on the other side, say it's just not the young people acting up. We have OGs up in here acting crazy. Have lost their mind. This generation even tells the Almighty that you got to accept me for who I am because I am your creation. And you supposed to love everybody no matter what because you, God, you are love and you supposed to love unconditionally. So no matter of my lifestyle, you got to love me. Tell somebody they lost their mind. Now, I'm not going to, I decided I wasn't going to even respond to that mindset. I'm just going to direct your attention to the book of Jose. Jose chapter number four, verse number six. Jose four, I'll pause a minute for you to get it. But these young folks out here, law their mind. They don't come to church and submit. And not only the young people, I told you, all of them, the centennial, the, the, the generation X, the baby boom, all of them now, they tell God that you, you're going to love me. No, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do it your way right now because I'm just not ready to serve you right now. So I, I, I want to continue my fornication and and my daughter's lifestyle. I want to continue using my uh, drugs. I know in due time you're going to bring me out. But, but anyway, while I'm doing this, Father, you still love me. Y'all lost your mind. Jose chapter number 4, verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. This generation has rejected knowledge. Can't nobody tell them anything. And it's not just the young. The knowledge that the fact you don't even know who Yahweh is. You don't know who God is. You don't know who Yahshua is. God is holy. Yeshua the son is holy. They are righteous and they demand it. 
You lack knowledge. But that's not the only thing you lack knowledge because you don't know who God is. It's going to destroy you. You're going to go to hell that burns, that lake of fire that burns with brimstones for That's where you're going to go because you don't know who he is. You lack knowledge. Hear me, old people. People perish because they lack biblical knowledge, historical knowledge, medical, economic, science, the knowledge of political science, not truly understanding how the government function. And, and, and many lack street knowledge. A lot of innocent people got killed in the street because they, they just didn't understand mainstream social knowledge because we as believers, we alienate ourselves through isolation, separating the church from secular mainstream. We lack knowledge in the three dimensions of thought processing and algorithms in solving problems that will render better decisions and judgments having a much favorable outcome. Many lack intellectual, psychological competency, badly misdiagnosing a person's potential but not recognizing how to use them in their strength. We had a lot of businesses that failed because people just didn't know. Employers and those CEOs just didn't know how to treat people and how to intellectually get them to do what you want them to do and to be prosperous and productive. Every day we are taken advantage of because we're lacking knowledge all because of information that either was, that was withheld from us or information that we reject or for the lack of interest to pursue information to empower ourselves. So many continue in the vacuum of their religious practices. Many continue in a vacuum of poverty and struggles because they have become comfortable with its environments and choose to exist in that which is familiar to them. The lacking of faith, education, Financial resources are the conduits that leads to failure, disappointments, heartaches, brokenness, low self-esteem, and the worst of them all, hopelessness. Unfortunately, this is where we are as a pluralistic nation for reasons beyond our control many have been coerced into following a religion that diverted from the original foundational path of salvation that was created by Yahweh into altered paths that was manufactured by lies and deceit they were manufactured by lies and deceit. And the tragedy about the truth, as I said before, that you will discover is not too hard to find the truth, but it's very difficult to embrace, especially when you believe another way for so long. You're going to discover The thing that you put your trust in is the very thing that scatters you and set you on the way to an altered path. On today, I'm going to give you information that will reroute you from the altered path out of the rural area to the reentry path that will lead you to true salvation. It's going to lead us to the city of promise. 
the new Jerusalem. Let's go to 2 Chronicles chapter number 14, verses number 2 through 7. Two weeks ago, as I was in my prayer and devotional period, I was just, when I finished praying, I just grabbed my word and I opened it. I didn't get a chance to scroll. When I opened it, Holy Spirit said, look down and read. And I discovered after reading it that the scenario that's recorded in this Holy Scripture reflects a similar storyline of what we are living through on today. Tell your neighbor there is nothing new under the sun. Let's navigate to 2 Chronicles. So what I'm going to do, just to expedite time, when you get a chance on your own, I want you to read the previous chapter because it will give you a backdrop, a better understanding to what's happening here in 2 Chronicles. This is after the death of Solomon, and this was during the time of the division of the 12 tribes. You know, there was a time where the 12 uh, tribes had separated, the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is uh, uh, during this time, you know, when you have the tribe of Judah that who had separated from Israel along with the other tribes, other tribes, because they just didn't want to follow the rules of Solomon's son who took over and the kingdoms were upset. They didn't want to follow him, so they separated. But I need you to read the previous chapter so to give you a better understanding of what's going on during this time. Now, now in the previous chapters also leading up to this, you had Solomon's servant. The, this, the Solomon's ser servant this is talking about the son of Solomon's servants uh, in chapter 13 who took up and he decided that he wanted to be king of Israel. So he went up against the various tribes. But in this particular uh, case that he was going up against the tribe of Judah. And you will find out that Judah became victorious when there was, it was Judah, Judah had only 400 men in battle, 400,000 men in battle and while the servants of Solomon's son had 800,000. So it was like a show and he was definitely going to overthrow Judah. But Judah got up and declared the salvation of the Lord and the promises of him. And uh, you will find out as you read that Judah had overthrew the, uh, the enemy. Amen. So we're going to start here in chapter 14. Verses 1, so Abijah slept with his father, and Abijah was the one who went up against a Solomon's servant son who was trying to overthrow Abijah. But so, and this was years later after uh, Abijah won, so Abijah had died, slept with his father. And they buried him in the city of David, and Asa, his son, reigned in his stead. In his days, the land was quiet Ten years. Let me say that again. Asa reigned in his stead. In his days, the land was quiet ten years. First number two, and Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of Yahweh, his Elohim. For he took away the altars of the strange gods and the high places and break down the images and cut down the groves and commanded Judah to seek Yahweh, Elohim of their fathers, and to do the law and his commandments. Also in first number five, he took took away out of all the cities of Judah, the high places and the images and the kingdom was quiet before him. In other words, he sanctified the place. Everything that was ungodly, he got rid of it. Tell somebody, got rid of it. First mm. number six, and he built fenced cities in Judah for the land had rest and he had no war in those years because Yahweh has given him rest. Therefore, he said unto Judah, let us build these cities and make about them walls and towers, gates and bars while the land is yet 
before us. In other words, while we yet possess the land and, and there is no war. Let us build these things because we have sought Yahweh our Elohim. We have sought him and he has given us rest on every side. So they build and prosper the wall. When I read that, when I finished reading that, I stopped right there. And I fell on my knees. And I began to pray. Because I saw something special. And that is King Asa, when he came into power, the Bible said that he pleased the Lord. Let me say that. He pleased the Lord. So he threw out all those idol gods. Everything that wasn't pleasing to God the creator, he threw them out. Asa got in place. He said, I'm going to move everything that's not like God. Our, our title, our lesson subject for the day is the path of reentry. The path of reentry. The thing that blew my mind was that after he cleaned the house and sanctified himself, he told the city, told Judah, Judah, bring back the laws and the commandments of God because previously they had stopped following the, uh, Yahweh. Y'all know how Israel had done Israel as Israel uh, always got in trouble, had turned away from God using uh, serving other gods and allowing all other kind of things to happen. So King Asa said, look, I'm going to clean the house up and it pleased the Lord so much that the Lord gave them peace before that if you read chapters before that there was wars going on all the time wars was going on the time Israel was always in war you had Judah all of them was always in war but the Bible says that he pleased God so much that they, they went 10 years without war it was quiet in the land that Yahweh gave them rest and in the midst of that rest he allows them to prosper. So after I finished reading that, man, I fell to my knees and began to pray. I said, Father, what are you saying to me? What are you saying to this house? He said, two years ago, when you started back this ministry, a touch of grace ministry, you clean house. You even told the members that, and even you challenged yourself. You said, I, you know, some things that we do, and I'm talking right now to Sabbath keepers right now. I'm going to get back to the others. Right now, the Sabbath keepers, you know, we, we have gotten so complacent and we started doing things and taking the Lord's Sabbath for granted. Things that we shouldn't be doing, we started doing and we got comfortable. We got comfortable in doing it. But when I came back and I took the rams and we started the touch of grace. I said, you know what? I said, we're going to do this thing right. The Bible tells us on the Sabbath day that we're not supposed to work. And the reason we don't go to restaurants and other things because other people are working. And if we go to those restaurants, those places, then we indulge and we're, we are aiding and abetting, abetting uh, uh, to what they're doing because they're not, they shouldn't be working. The Bible says rest from your labels. But we will always find excuses why we have to go to the store. And you know, we, we grew up in this thing. Our parents taught us how to prepare. You don't wait till the last minute. You know the Sabbath is coming, so you do everything that you need to do because the Sabbath is coming in on Friday night. So you need to go to the store. If you need to gas up your car, whatever you need to do, you need to pre make preparation and do it. But we had gotten so content 
that we started making excuses. Well, I need some gas, so, so I'm going to get, get there ain't no harm. You know, the ox is in the ditch, so let me go get some gas. Oh, well, I'm hungry, and I, I don't have no food. Let me go to the, the store so I can, you know, get something to eat. So we find ourselves, you know, in the source. The next thing you know, we find ourselves in movie theaters and shows and whatever. I mean, one thing leads to another. So I said to go, I told the members of this congregation, I told them, I said, look, if we're going to do this thing, we're going to do it. We're going to do this thing the right way. And so we all decided that, that we're going to now reprogram ourselves and take those old bad habits out where we had stopped honoring and respecting God's holy day. And we're going to do what we're supposed to do. We're going to prepare so we can keep the Sabbath day holy. And I had one young man that said to me, he said, look in the days world where we live in here in Western civilization, it's impossible to keep the Sabbath holy. It's just impossible. And when he said that to, to me, I said, the devil is a liar. There is nothing that's too hard. The Bible said, my commandments are not grievous. Amen. And we ought to delight in them. So what we say, okay, well, I say, okay, well, I, I tell you what, I'm going to prove a liar out of you because we can't do it. And I even shared it with this congregation. And so we all made that commitment that we're going to honor God's holy Sabbath the way it was intended to be. And so the Lord has blessed us. Yes, there's been some challenges. Just so last week alone, I was so thirsty. My body was dehydrated. I didn't have any more water in the, in, in the church here. And I was just so dehydrated. So when I left the building, I said, uh, I said but the enemy spoke into my ear. He said, well, you know, it's all right. You can go, go get you something. Well, that's common sense. You know, the, the ox is in the ditch. You need to go get you some water, boy. And everything like that. I said, well, you know what? I only live 30 minutes from here. And sure enough, I can wait till I get home. I'm not going to the store because if I go to the store and get one thing, I'm going to get something else. So I said, no, I'm not going to do it. And Father blessed me and sustained me. And then when I, by the time I got home, I was fine. Yes, I did. I made it home. And I drank that water and I felt good. I said, Lord, thank you because I didn't break your Sabbath by going to the stores. I was really excited about that. And so then when he showed me this, and then I say, Father, what are you speaking to me? What are you saying to me after two years of honoring, after cleaning our lives up and cleaning things up and, and doing what this king Asa did? That's he, and I believe the Holy Spirit was showing me that. He said, well, now, Harold, now just like Asa, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your congregation. I'm going to give you peace. I'm going to get, see, the warfare that you had, the financial warfare, seemed like every time you look around, there was a need financially. Every time there was a bill here to pay, a bill there. You know, your members had a bill here and, and a bill there. You know, every time you turn around, you didn't have no peace. There was health issues that was among the congregation. You know, some folks had cancer. Some folks had sugar diabetes. Some people were dealing with high blood pressure, all kind of other stuff. But the Bible said, he said, I'm going to give you peace. I'm going to be give you peace. I'm going to give you rest. In other words, the things that we used to go through, the difficulty and challenges we used to have, the warfare that we all that we had. He said, I'm gonna give you peace, I'm gonna give you rest. So, what does that mean? A touch of grace that means that your trouble for a season is gonna be over. There's gonna be we are now approaching a season where God is gonna give us favor in our life, that we're gonna live in the overflow and during the season of rest. Where well, we're not troubled about how we're going to pay this and how we're going to pay that. The Lord is going to allow us to build. If you notice, almost three years ago, when I was doing the state of the ministry, the state of the address for the ministry, and we talked about what we had accomplished the first year and where we're going in the next five years, we gave you an outline and plan. And going into our third year was supposed to be the year where we are building. Amen. And, and so I was just so, I mean, I was just excited in my spirit when I saw this and when I read this. So the Lord had told, he said, prophesy to the congregation. Let them know that they're about to enter a season of rest. They don't have to worry about, you know, what bills to pay. They're going to be able to pay, pay their bills with ease and live in the overflow. Can the church say hallelujah? The path of reentry. 
this is what we're talking about today. I'm getting back to that in a minute. So like King Asa, God gave him favor because he obeyed God and he restored his life to where it was intended to be from the altered path back into the re-entry of the path where God has designed for Judah to be, not serving no other gods, not doing other things but loving him and keeping his laws and his commandments. And so I am just excited because the past couple of years, yeah, people laughed at us, amen. People laughed at us, but it was okay. They even laughed at us at the numbers that we had, but we are doing great things with this little uh, little that we have. How many know that littles become, little becomes much? And that's what the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, Harold, the first part of your ministry, he said, what I got to do is I have to prepare you guys for the, for the influx that's coming in. I got to prepare you guys so when they come in the door, they will see the standard of, of, of holiness. They will see the uh, lifestyle of righteousness. I'm preparing you for the people that are coming. This is shocking. I'm going to make this statement. I know it's going to shock you. But it's okay. I'm here to grow you. It's leadership that causes people to err in their ways. Let me say that to you guys over here. It's leadership that causes you to err in your ways. When you look at the kings, all the kings and the monarchs that's recorded in history, when the king gives a decree or they give an order, you better carry it out or suffer the consequences. And in most cases, these kings who started, especially the kings of Israel, when you started out in a good way, but somewhere down the line you went off the path because you started following other gods. When you do that, the people are going to follow you. Why? Because they trust you. That's my king. And whatever my king say, I'm going to do. I'm going to follow and go with my king. You only had a few people that went, went against the king. You know, uh, uh, the, the Hebrew boy, Daniel, and the kings tried to kill him, but they couldn't kill him because God was right there. And the fiery furnace, the son of, of God, Yahshua, was right there in the fiery furnace with them. Kings, they did not read through the throw three in there, but I see four, and the fourth one looked like a son of Yahweh. Did not, did not, did not, the only three. And I say that to let you know you don't have to bow down to these kings and leaders when they have you to go against what your father Yahweh has instructed you to do. That is the time when you all to be defiant to leadership. It's when they alter the way. What I mean, defiant, I don't talk about openly rebuke them. It's time to run. One of the disciples in the scripture said, you follow me as I follow the Messiah. But some of us have gotten to a place where we stopped worshiping Yahweh the Father and we started worship leadership. And it was leadership that error in their ways. All of a sudden, they get a revelation. They say, oh, it's okay to eat pork. And a lot of scholars kind of mix that thing up. So now preachers start preaching pork. It's okay to eat pork. The reason Yahweh told you not to eat pork, he, he made you. He know what's going to harm you and what's not going to. He know what causes blood pressure and all other kind of disease because of certain foods. That's why there are health laws to nurture you. Right now I'm talking to Sabbath churches. 
Now you got your people, you teaching this false doctrine. And now you got your people, you're eating scavengers of the sea. You got them, you have them eating pork. All because you said it is okay. And now you have them so confused they worship it on Sunday because now they say, well, it's because you said it doesn't matter what day you worship because you are, have become so weak and that you wasn't strong in the faith that you allow Christendom to come into your life, into your heart and tell you that Sunday worship is okay. You allow them to tell you that Sabbath is obsolete. That the Sabbath went away with the law when Yeshua come, came down to redeem us from the curse of the law. And you let them tell you in your ears that the law of God was cursed. And so now I look around and a lot of the brothers and sisters that I grew up in church in the faith have now walked away from the true path. And they're, they're now in these big churches, Sunday churches, that on Sabbath, instead of keeping God's Sabbath holy, they doing everything under the sun. But I come to tell you, preacher man, their blood is required on your hands. Which means that our Father's not going to blame them. He's going to blame you. And there's a strong possibility this grace may protect them. People, it's leadership that causes you to err. I was a music minister at one church and I watched the pastor control his people. When he would get upset with somebody he would then command the rest of his congregation, don't you speak to that one. Don't you deal with this one. And so everybody in the congregation began to treat that other person like a black sheep. They don't have no dealings with them or whatever. What kind of spirit is that that's coming from that leader that he's given that directive for other people to hate and mistreat and misuse another brother and sister of the faith. That's not God. But yet you follow those instructions. And so now you become a part of what he's doing or what she's doing. Now you're both are errands, erring in your ways. But I got good news. To many of you who had taken an altered path, regardless of what reason, you can gain reentry. All you have to do is surrender and give up those idol gods and restore yourself to the place where it used to be. You win. God, Yahweh the Father, the place where you felt good, the place where you truly felt his power, where you felt the love. So take off every unclean. Like here, here in King Asa, what he did, he threw away everything that was unclean, and he went back to obeying the word of God. That's what you do. I tell my people all the time, look, I'm just your, your teacher. Don't treat me as a God. Don't treat me as I'm so special. I'm just like you, but the Father has favored me that I'm able to share his word with them. But don't you worship me. Y'all sure didn't even allow his disciples to worship him. Everything 
that Yahshua, every miracle that he, he worked, and, and he always gave credit to the Father. He didn't take the glory. You look at these pastors. They walk around arrogant, like they are somebody, because they are preachers and pastors. And you crazy enough to assist them. They are your teachers. They are your spiritual counselors. When they go into another place that you know that the word of God say that they shouldn't be in this particular position or this era because this does not represent the kingdom of God. Don't you go there with him. Y'all being faithful to leaders and not being faithful to God. And in doing so, you're losing and, and you're, you're leaving the path to salvation to follow somebody who's blinded and decide to go their own way. Are you crazy? People, you have pastors who say, I'm flawed, and you catch them, they get caught in their little stuff that they're doing, craziness, having babies, you know, and you know, Lord have mercy. Just so on this week alone, there were three pastors in South Carolina. The accused misappropriate conduct with a minor. And you still sitting under that pastor? You crazy!
the streets I pay the gold.